Y'all talking about me? <laughs> Good morning. How's the family this morning? Man, it is good to be here. We want to thank the band. They, they had to plug in some people to help this morning. We appreciate it, Nick. Thank you so much. You know, this morning, I'm going to talk to you about something that makes some of you a little uncomfortable. I, I know that happens from time to time. Uh, I know last week's sermon might have made some people a little uncomfortable. And I, I think the deal is if you're uncomfortable, you're paying attention. I didn't see anybody run out the back door, so they didn't get that bad. So we're going to, you know, today we're going to talk about Bible stories. And, and I'm talking about things that the Bible presents us with that sometimes many of us really don't pay attention to. So to be truthful this morning with all of you, being truthful to me, how many of you opened your Bible this week and read? There you go. Sadly to say, and this is not just here, but everywhere, less than 50% of Christians open their Bibles each week to read. Less than that per day. Open their Bibles to actually read what's in the Bible. So I guess my question this morning, a really good question for all of us this morning is, why do Christians not read their Bible regularly or not at all? Why would that happen? You know, I ran that uh, question past my wife here. Had some good answers to that. Basically, some people, they don't feel comfortable because they don't understand what the Bible says. I, I guess, uh, here's the best reasons. I don't have time. That's the best or, or the most revealing question I, answer I get every time I ask that. I don't have time. But the truth is, it's not that I don't have time, I don't make time. That's the truth of the whole thing. So the minute a person says that to me, I look at them like, okay, you are kind of got the twist on it there a little bit. You don't have time or you don't make time. So that tells me that if you don't make time to read your Bible, how much time are you making to be in, in a relationship with God? Amen? Another one. I have a hard time understanding it. I have a hard time understanding it. Rather, once again, I don't have time for a Bible study to learn more about the Bible. I don't, I don't have time for that. Or I don't make time for a Bible study. Or I don't study enough. I, you know, there's a lot of good study Bibles out there that help along those, those avenues to learn you know, more about the Bible. And Bible studies present that. I was provided with this this morning. C.S. Lewis quoted, It is Christ himself, not the Bible, who is the true word of God. The Bible, read in the right spirit, with the guidance of good teachers, will bring us to him. We must not use the Bible as a sort of encyclopedia out of which texts, texts can be taken for use as weapons. Rather, don't twist the words in the Bible to fit what you want it to say. Don't use it as a weapon to go against somebody. Use it as a love letter to bring somebody to know Christ. Amen? But that's not the way sometimes the Bible is taken in. I even get this. I have a hard time believing everything I read in the Bible. I don't think all that stuff in the Bible is true. Well, if that's the case, maybe your faith and your belief in the Creator is not where it needs to be. Not where it needs to be. Maybe it's just a little weak. That's possible. Because if you don't have a connection with the Creator, how can you believe in His Word? There are even Christian people that are afraid. They, they are afraid the Bible isn't true. Or... Maybe they're afraid that it is true. Scary stuff, right? So maybe people don't really want to know what the Bible says because it might interfere with what's going on in their life. I've run into that over and over again. I was one of them. I was one of them. But all that's changed because the relationship, remember that big word, the relationship you have with Christ 
changes how you look at God's Word and how you look at God. It, it changes everything. Why should we read our Bibles regularly? Why would that be? Well, everyone should own and read the Bible because, this is just one thing, because it's the best-selling book of all time. That's a good reason, wouldn't you say, that we ought to read it if it is the best-selling book of all time. Everyone should read the Bible because of its great influence on our world. And that's another good reason to get into the Bible. Everyone should read the Bible because it's changed more lives than any other piece of literature in history. There's three really good reasons why we should read our Bibles. Those are good reasons, amen? But the Bible is also packed full of stories, of adventures, excitement, everything that you can have in a good novel or in a good book. It's all there and more. We'll pick up a magazine, a people's magazine, or to read about all the celebrities and all the stupid stuff. Excuse me. The stuff that's not real. But we won't believe. We won't read the Bible and believe what the Bible tells us. We can find ourselves on that fence sometimes. And that's the way some of these things work. I have even had someone say to me, I don't like to read, so I'll just wait till the movie comes out. My reply, the movie's already out, and it's being played over and over in our daily lives. The movie's here. It's the big picture, right? And the director is awesome. We just need to look at things that way. How exciting things can be if we really dig into them. To believe the stories, you need to believe in the Creator. I have a picture here that was painted, that was given to me here a while back. And this picture, I'm going to hide behind it. If you look close at this picture right here, you'll know that this isn't a print, that this picture was actually painted. And... We know by looking at it that an artist painted this picture. This picture did not create itself. It's not a print. It was done with a paintbrush or pencils or however they do it. Watercolors, I think, is what this one was. But it was created by somebody. Now, would any of you deny if a picture is painted, somebody had to create it? Amen? What about the great picture of this world? What about all the great things we see when we travel around our country? God's taken His paintbrush and painted it. But this world did not create itself, as some people want to believe. Someone created what we live in now. God Himself. So why is it we have such a hard time believing in all that? The Bible tells us in Genesis that God created everything. John chapter 1 verse 3. You want to go with me there? John chapter 1 verse 3. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Okay, now he tells us that. It's coming straight from God, God's Word. He tells us that, but why should we believe that? Why shouldn't we believe that all this came from a big bang somewhere? Why should we believe that? It comes down to faith. It comes down to faith. Can you imagine a world today without God? In a lot of places, it's a mess. And we've seen God taken out of so many different things and what has happened every time that God's taken out of it. Look at our schools. Good example. Look at our government. Good example. Take God out of it and what is there? It's a mess. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. Once again, why would we believe that? Maybe to some, they've heard many Bible stories preached in the same way over and over again or presented to them in the same way over and over again ever since they were a small child. You know, any, any small child that's been taken to church regularly, grew up hearing the stories preached or told, VBS, Vacation Bible School, they learn stories. Children's Church, they learn stories. And they learn those stories repetitively, being presented to them. And this was one of the things that probably is the hardest part is because they've heard them so many times, they've become not very exciting, not very interesting, and boring. Boring. Now, I'm not talking about small children. I'm talking about adults. They've heard them over and over again. Maybe preached in a different way every time, but it's the same story over and over again. Coming out of the Bible. It's repetitive. God gave it all to us. When we read it, is it up to God to make it exciting or is it up to us to get excited? I think it's up to us to get excited about what stories are in the Bible, what God presents to us, and what He's revealed to us and what He has not. Now, there are a lot of things that we have questions about. And God doesn't reveal those to us, and I know there's a reason. And one of these days, maybe we'll know that reason, or one of these days, when we get to heaven, we're not even going to care. <laughs> to get someone excited about reading the Bible, we need to be excited when we read the Bible. We need to be excited when we talk to people about what God has done and what His Word says. We don't just need to just to bring it to them and say, well, the Bible says this. Get excited. Put a smile on your face. Show some energy. We don't see much of that anymore. Not at all. And I think that's where we need to be. God's just there. He's not that exciting piece of our life that He needs to be. Many of you know that my favorite TV show was the Andrew Griffin Show. Man, I love Andy Riffin. I can, I can take a quiz on him, and I, I guarantee you, I can ace that quiz on every show because I loved it. I loved the small town stuff. I loved the lessons that were taught through his episodes. I loved all that. One episode in particular that I really enjoyed that I, I think pertains right here right now is, is, is when Opie and all his friends had received a new teacher at school. Some of you... Older people know what I'm talking about. You've been there. He got a new teacher, and she was just covering them up with history questions, history homework, and they just hated it. They didn't like all the work and didn't want to do it, so they come running into Andy's office, complaining to him about how old lady Crump, that was what he called her, said she's just putting all this homework on us, all this history stuff, and it just we just can't, we just don't get it. And Andy sticks his big foot right in his mouth. And he says, well, you know, I wasn't very good at history, so why don't you just tell her you come by it naturally? Oh, that was not good. Because when the word got back to his teacher that history wasn't all that important, that's the way the boys took it back to her, then she's mad. Guys, you ever seen a lady mad about something? She was upset. So when she calls Andy out on it, he realizes right then, I've made a mess out of this thing. I've said something I shouldn't have said. And I'm basically, what we do as Christians sometimes, I'm leading these kids away from something good for them instead of bringing them to it. So I need to fix this. So he does it indirectly so they don't even know he's doing it. He starts talking about history. And at that time, what is it young boys liked in that? That era, they like guns and cowboys and the whole deal. So that's what he does. He starts talking about the gun that was so loud it was heard around the world. And they don't know anything about this gun, but this has got to be something awesome. Andy puts a spin on it. He makes it exciting. 
talking about the Redcoats and the whole deal. And he got these kids all fired up. They want to start a club. They want to start a history study, just like a Bible study. We're going to learn all about it. Next thing you know, they're in class. They know all the things they need to know in their history book. And they can answer questions just like that. Andy made it exciting for them. He presented them with facts that they'll remember the rest of their lives. That's where we need to be with our Bibles. Looking at the stories and the facts in the Bible and what God does for us and what He's provided for us. Maybe this is the way we should approach reading our own Bibles. It was brought to my attention this morning that just picking up your Bible and reading it is not the way it works. You know, if you just pick it up and read it like a magazine off the shelf, you're not going to get a lot out of it. But if you are spiritually prepared, if you're prayed up and you're spiritually prepared to open that Bible and start reading it can overwhelm you with emotion of how much God truly loves us. The Bible truly offers something for everyone. Not just me as a pastor, not just our elders, our leaders, but it offers something for everyone. Something. There's something in there that can relate to you or will relate to you if you just open and read. Some, story in the, some stories in the Bible are like, some parts of it's like a Western. It could be a good Western, or it could be a war story, or a mystery, or an adventure. All that's in the Bible. But mainly, mainly more than anything else, it's a love story from beginning to end. So it has everything that you could want in there if you just open it and read what's going on in the Bible and what God's Word says to us. And if we just think about the impact of some of the Bible stories, I asked uh, my granddaughter this morning, Kylie Joe, I said, what is your favorite story in the Bible? Well, I was so proud of her because she liked the same story I like, Jonah. Of course, Jonah's about a big fish, and all I think about is catching big fish. So this story relates to me really, really well. And I said, well, why... Do you like that particular story? One thing is, it's, it's very interesting, and it's kind of unbelievable. That's what she said. It's hard to believe that someone could actually get swallowed by a big fish and live. So it has something there. But once again, if you believe in God, you believe that that actually happened. But the way it happened through the whole story is the remarkable part about it. We know that Jonah was running from God. And we know that God didn't let him run far. He put him in difficult circumstances. As we would say, he let him hit rock bottom and then gave him a way to get out. That happens in our lives, amen? So there's a story that pertains to us. My wife gave me a different one. She said she loved the story of Ruth. And I thought of all the people that would give me a story out of the Bible, why Ruth? That's kind of unusual. Not for her, but it was to me. And I said, why? She said, because Ruth was willing to give up everything. Everything. To do the right thing. No turning back. Once she gave it all up, she was done. But she was willing to do that. That's a Bible that, that that's a story in the Bible that many of us could learn from. What is it God can do for us if we give up everything? We surrender control to Him. There's so many different things to learn. In Genesis, the story of Noah, the great flood. How a man over 500 years old that God could go to this man and instruct him to build a huge boat, which was the ark, that would withstand a flood that would just destroy the earth. And how Noah and his family just floated around out there until all the water receded and they wound up in a new place. Man, that's an adventure story, right? If you look at it that way, the story of David and Goliath, man, this is a great story. Great story. We know 
from the book of Samuel. We're told that this young boy, he chose to get in a fight with a giant man. And how he was the underdog. There was no way he was going to win this fight. And how God provided him with the courage and the ability to battle. And when something we might consider today as just a toy with a slingshot, he takes a little rock and cracks him in the head and kills him. Now tell me that's not exciting. It's all in how you interpret it. It's all in how you look at it. Shortly after that, he becomes the king of God's people. You know, he goes from a little underdog, little guy, little underdog, and all at once he's a king. That's a story in itself. How about a couple of my favorites? The story of Daniel in the lion's den. It's in the book of Daniel chapter 6, where Daniel was thrown in a den full of lions, and overnight, the lions don't even mess with him. God provided him with a way and the protection not to be harmed. All because he wouldn't bow down. All because he wouldn't give in to their prayer time, into their, just stop praying the way he was supposed to. Everything he was doing wrong, they didn't like, so we're going to throw him in the lion's den. But he stood his ground. He didn't run away. And one of my very favorite, the story of three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how Nebuchadnezzar, he was so angry with them because they wouldn't bow down and worship his God. So he throws them in a fiery furnace. We know these stories. Throws them in the fiery furnace, the furnace that was heated so hot that it killed soldiers that were putting them in there. But Jesus climbed in there with them. The greatest superhero ever got in there with them and protected them. You know, kids are all about that nowadays. The superheroes on TV. What greater superhero was there than Jesus Christ? You know, it's funny because they, nowadays, uh, we don't have a hard time, many people don't have a hard time believing in zombies, Bigfoot. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Vampires, they believe in all that. And they read about it, and they go and watch the movies, and they get wound up in it like it's real. The Bible's real. God's Word's the real thing. And then we have the love story, which we find in the books of Matthew and Luke. The greatest love story of all time. How a father sacrificed his son because of his love for everyone. How man, Jesus Christ, was beaten severely and nailed to a cross and died as forgiveness for our sinful lives. That's a love story in itself. And because he is the greatest superhero ever, death could not hold him. And he came back to life to live with us forever. Amen? Isn't that what zombies do? Don't they come back to life out of the grave and go around chewing people's heads off or something? I, I don't know. I've never watched one. I just They pop up all the time. Someone's going to come back to life. It's going to be from Jesus Christ, not anyone else. Amen? These are just a few of the great stories we find in the Bible. And each story teaches us something that we all need to know. It's kind of like I just talked about with the episodes from the Andy Griffin Show. They all had a message. Each story in this Bible has a message for us in our lives. It has an impact on our lives and some direction in our life. The Bible was not created just to sit on your coffee table or lay around your house, right on the dash of your truck or car, 
or just to be brought to church on Sundays. It was not created for that. It was created for us to read and learn about our Creator. Amen? No matter what you have going on in your life, good or bad, the Bible can reveal something about it. It can lead you through tough times and share with you how to appreciate the good times. It has something for everyone. It amazes me how people struggle to believe in God and His Word. That's the whole amazing thing of this thing. I think, once again, that comes down to relationship. In 1970s, there was a movie came out called The Exorcist. Many of you kind of my age, I won't tell you how old I am, but many of you kind of my age, you know the movie. That everyone began to, would go to this movie, The Exorcist. It's about a little girl that was demon-possessed. Man, this movie was scary. I went and saw it. This little girl, she could raise herself off the bed. Her head spun around on her shoulders. She spit up pea soup, they told me. So anyway, it was scary, right? Everybody was scared. And after that, everyone believed that there were demons that did this stuff. But they still, people that were interviewed after the movie believed this stuff, but they were still having a hard time believing in God. I would hope that we wouldn't be that way. There is a devil. We know that. But we have protection from the devil because of Jesus Christ. Amen? The Bible gives us comfort in all situations. It gives us directions in our daily lives and our future. The Bible gives us hope. And without hope, what is there? Nothing. Today, I'd encourage you to pick it up, open it up, and start reading your Bible. The Bible can change your life. It's changed mine, my wife's, my family's. Because we took time to read it, but it wasn't the Bible in itself, and you've got to remember that. It's the relationship with Jesus Christ that will change your life. If you just apply it and apply what you learn into your daily life, you will immediately start seeing changes in your life. Immediately. I'm not talking about you got to wait down the road. The minute you start applying God's Word into your life, it will immediately change your life. Not only will it change your life, it will change your family, it will change your friends, it will change the people around you, and it will give you a better outlook on this world today. Get out of the negative. Get in the positive. Start today and learn all the things the Bible has to offer. You through God's Word. And inject these things. Eject all this information that you learn from God into your lives. The Bible should be a joy to read. It's just what you make of it. Just like in everything we do, from physical activity to sports to work to everything. You have to apply yourself. You have to discipline yourself. That's a big word. Discipline yourself to take the time to open your Bible and get into God's Word. Once again, be spiritually prayed up, prayed up, ready to get in the Bible and read. Set aside time. Set aside time to read your Bible. Many people go, well, I don't really know how to read the Bible. If you ask people right here in this room, half of them will give you one answer to how to do it, half of them will give you another. People will give you all kinds of directions. I'm going to tell you how it was taught to me. I was told to read Genesis all the way through. Read the whole book of Genesis. And before moving forward, go over and read the New Testament. And then come back and read, finish the Old Testament and it will all start to apply together. That's the way I learned to do it. Not everybody's going to do it that way. But that worked for me. I read the New Testament twice before I ever finished the Old Testament. The Old Testament's a little tougher reading sometimes. But what you can learn and what you can apply in your life is amazing. Turn with me this morning just one more piece of Scripture. We're going to close here. This is James chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. Kind of back over at the back of your Bible. 
James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I like this part. Don't just read it. Do it. Do what it says. Want to change this world? Want to change your part of it? Do what it says. The changes will come. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, Father, and we just are so thankful. We thank you for the blessings and the favor that you show here in your church house and that you pour out on this church family. Father, we thank you of all the good things that are just happening. We thank you for the building program that's going on and doing so well. We thank you so much for the loan. And Father, that we're able to move forward. Father, we're thankful that we stayed behind you instead of stepping out in front of you. And Father, we're thankful that you gave us your word. Father, this morning our prayer is that we spend more time with you. We find that personal relationship in our daily contact with you. And Father, that we would pick up that Bible, open it up and read your word, bury ourselves in the stories in the scripture. And Father, let you lead and, and provide us with our future of what it looks like through your word. Father, I pray today that anyone here just struggling, they're struggling just having that connection with you, Father, that they, they really don't know where to start. Well, it's real easy. We start with our ABCs. So anyone here today that's struggling with their relationship with God or they do not know God, would you pray with me this morning? You could pray out loud, silently. You pray any way you want to. But pray like this. Father God, come into my heart. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of this mess I've got going on in my life. And Father, I know your word will help with that. Come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And Father, I believe you sent your only Son to die on that cross to cover my sins and shortcomings. And Father, starting today, I commit my life to you. And I commit to walking and believing and being in your word, Father. Father, we love you. We pray today that everything we said and did here was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. And I always say, if you said that prayer for the very first time, welcome aboard. If you want to know what you do next in that walk with the Lord, visit with these lay pastors lined along the wall here, our elders, or come visit with me. I'll be at the back. God bless you.